Good morning, I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for streaming with us. The Senate is set to pass the trillion dollar bipartisan infrastructure bill today. It's the first time in decades Republicans and Democrats have come together on a package like this, but it could hit some roadblocks in the House. We have the latest from Capitol Hill as the vote gets underway. In Greece, wildfires are forcing thousands to evacuate. More than a week of record heat there has sparked nearly 600 fires across the country. One official is now calling it a biblical catastrophe. And a new tropical threat is gaining strength in the Caribbean and taking aim at Florida. The National Hurricane Center says it's on track to become a tropical storm today, and we will continue to follow its track. Let's take a live look at the Senate floor, where a vote on the bipartisan infrastructure bill is set to get underway in just a moment. The $1 trillion package includes $110 billion for roads and bridges, $39 billion for public transit, $65 billion to expand broadband internet, $110 billion for roads and bridges, $39 billion for public transit, again, $65 billion for broadband, and it's expected to pass the Senate, but has a long way to go in the House. Let's bring in congressional correspondent Rachel Scott for more. Rachel, how is this vote expected to go? Well, it's happening in just minutes, and as you said, Diane, it took a very long time for us to get here. We're talking about weeks of negotiations here on Capitol Hill and over at the White House and several late nights here uh, in the Senate, and now they are just moments away from passing this bipartisan infrastructure package. And this is a rare bipartisan agreement. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says this is the first time in decades we have seen Republicans and Democrats come together on a package like this. As you said, $1 trillion, billions to help roads and bridges and broadband internet as well. We are expecting approximately 18 to 20 Republicans to back this, to vote with Democrats, to move this forward. Again, all of this is a product of these bipartisan negotiations that have really been going on for weeks now, Diane. Now, former President Trump has called this bill a disgrace that would make his party look weak, foolish, and dumb. But still, some 20 Republican senators are expected to vote for it. How significant is that, Rachel? Yeah, it's interesting, the break here. And even though former President Donald Trump has repeatedly blasted this bipartisan infrastructure package, clearly not trying to give President Biden a win here, you still have Republicans that are breaking from former President Donald Trump on this, something that we haven't really quite seen uh, as frequently over on the House side when it comes to following former President Donald Trump. And uh, obviously, people like Liz Cheney, who have re rebuked the former president, paying consequences of being stripped from leadership for that. It remains to be seen how this goes forward in the House, whether or not you'll have some House Republicans that will want to stay closer to the former president. But to be clear here, there are Republicans that are opposing this. Uh, Senator Rick Scott is one of them. He looks at the money that this is going to add to the federal deficit, some $250 billion. He says that price tag is just way too high. But if we go back uh, to, to when pre former President Donald Trump was in office and look at the infrastructure package that he was proposing, uh, it, it added way more to the federal deficit than this uh, bipartisan infrastructure package does. So this is expected to go through, but not every Republican is expected to be on board. And I'm sure we'll hear a lot from the former president. He is already uh, promising that he is going to support primary challengers to those senators who are up for re-election in 2022, Diane. Now, Rachel, this bill is the product of months of roller coaster negotiations back and forth. So what did it take to get to this compromise, and how does it compare to President Biden's original plan? Yeah, and President Biden will be the first one to say that Democrats did not get everything that they wanted here. A lot was stripped out from this bill. Really, the back and forth over this when it came down to it was how to pay for this package. One trillion dollars. You have uh, $550 billion in new spending. Republicans and Democrats were at odds over just how to pay for all of this. The, the president wanted to raise taxes on people that earn $400,000 or more. That was a non-starter for Republicans. So what they ended up doing is using some of the money that was left over from COVID relief uh, funds to, to help fund and pay for this package. But still, Democrats, especially progressive, they are very quick to point out here that this needs to be bigger, that Democrats need to go farther on this. And so that's why you're hearing House progressives saying they will not vote for this bipartisan infrastructure package unless Democrats pass a much larger and sweeping package first, Diane. And Democrats unveiled this three and a half trillion dollar budget resolution. It's supposed to focus on family, climate, health care. 
but they are planning to pass it without any Republican support. And, and so how is that going to work and how might it affect the bipartisan bill? Yeah, exactly. And this is because in the Senate, as you know, it is split 50-50. Democrats do hold the majority, Vice President Kamala Harris being the tie-breaking vote here. So they're planning to use a special process we call reconciliation here in the Senate to muscle this through on their own. The thing about this is, is they cannot afford to lose a single Democratic vote. This package that they unveiled just yesterday is $3.5 trillion. There are some moderate Democrats who are really just not on board with that process price tag at all. But of course, over on the House side, they're looking at this bipartisan package. They say they want this $3.5 trillion package to be passed first. And so bottom line here is this really has a long way to go. And this is really going to be a delicate balance for not only the president, but also Democratic leadership. Because over in the House, Democrats have a very slim majority. They can only afford to lose four votes. So they're going to have to keep all the wings of their party on the same page. Moderates over in the Senate, progressives over in the House. House. This is going to be no easy task, Diane. All right, Rachel Scott, no easy task, that's for sure. And we will continue to follow the vote and have more on the results uh, once we do have them in. Now let's go to the latest on the pandemic. Right now, every state in the U.S. except Vermont is reporting either high or substantial transmission of COVID-19. The Delta variant is also infecting kids at an increasing rate. Florida currently has the highest number of young children hospitalized with the virus. Victor Kendo is in Hollywood, Florida with the latest. This morning, doctors are making an unprecedented push to get children vaccinated against COVID-19. As new pediatric COVID cases near 94,000 in just the last week and children are hospitalized at a rate nearly four times higher than just a month ago, the head of the American Academy of Pediatrics is now urging the FDA to authorize vaccines for 5 to 11-year-olds as quickly as possible. We need to be approaching um, uh, the trials and the authorization of the COVID vaccine for children with the same urgency that we did with adults. Um, just as it's a serious disease in adults, it can be a very serious disease in children. But Pfizer has not yet applied for emergency use authorization for 5 to 11-year-olds. That's expected to happen at the end of September. The company hoping to start giving out shots by the end of 2021, if not sooner. In Texas, where hospitals have started setting up outdoor overflow COVID tents once again, seven-year-old Enzo Montoya, a second grader, was hospitalized with the virus for more than two weeks. He had to be isolated for 10 days. Just one of his parents allowed to stay with him. They thought they'd taken the right precautions by getting vaccinated, but Enzo was somehow exposed. They're lucky that we were able to bring Enzo home, and it's very sad right now with COVID rising and kids. So we just want everyone to do their part, get vaccinated, not for themselves, but for the people who cannot get vaccinated. You know, the little kids um, are at risk right now. As children return to school during the COVID surge, a battle raging over masks. Two of the largest school districts in Texas now define Governor Greg Abbott's order requiring them on school property regardless of vaccination status. And in Florida, where they currently have the highest number of children hospitalized with COVID-19, two districts refusing to follow Governor DeSantis's ban on mask mandates, saying no one will be allowed to go without them. The goal is to keep our children out of the hospital. And why would you not err on the side of caution? DeSantis threatening to withhold pay from superintendents or school board members who go against his ban on mask mandates. That announcement from Florida's governor comes as many of the state's school districts go back to the classroom today and tomorrow. And while they go back and forth over masks, Florida just requested an additional 300 ventilators. Diane? All right, scary thought there. Thanks, Victor. And earlier on Good Morning America, Robin Roberts spoke to former acting director of the CDC and president of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Dr. Richard Besser, urging parents and schools to not underestimate the virus as kids head back to school. Let's listen. Do you agree with the growing call from the American Academy of Pediatricians urging the FDA to authorize vaccines for children under 12 as soon as possible? Well, I, I, I think the key there, Robin, is as soon as possible. You know, as a, as a pediatrician, I want to make sure that they are getting all of the safety data that they need to know that if I'm recommending these for my patients, they truly are safe. Hopefully, they'll have that information soon. But we can't count on vaccines for children protecting our children in schools this fall. And Rich, we're also hearing about children dealing with long COVID, ongoing symptoms even after recovering. How concerned are you about this? 
Well, you know, what, what it says to me is that there's a lot we don't know about this virus and its effect on, on everybody, in particular in, in, in children. And because of that, I, I urge parents, I urge schools, I urge governors not to underestimate what we're dealing with here. And we need to take all the steps that we can to keep our children safe. So with back to school season in full swing in parts of the country, and we just saw this in Victor's report, the battle over mass mandates in schools really heating up. Do you believe parents should get to choose if their children wear masks to school or should states and districts decide? Yeah, I, I don't think that this is something that we can uh, allow parents to choose on their own. You know, when we think about schools and getting kids in safely, there, there's a layered approach they're taking. So improved ventilation and separating kids in the in the classroom and doing testing and making sure your teachers and staff are vaccinated. But masks is a key piece of this. It's something that will protect those who've been vaccinated who may not have gotten a, a, enough protection because of immune problem and it protects children who can't get vaccinated yet. So. Allowing it to be an issue of personal choice um, is, is fine if it only affected your child, but it doesn't. It affects everyone around your child as well. Rich, as we said, you are a pediatrician. So bottom line, what is your message to parents this morning? You know, my message is we need to do everything we can to protect our kids. And, and the biggest thing that we can do is get vaccinated yourself because that will protect your children. It will protect other people's children. It will protect adults. And in some of the places where we're seeing the biggest outbreaks, the vaccination rates are the lowest. So please get your questions answered and consider getting vaccinated. All right. Our thanks to Robin and Dr. Besser for that interview. Meanwhile, the U.S. military is moving to mandate vaccination against COVID-19 for service members. As of now, 60 percent of active duty military members are fully vaccinated and Pentagon leaders have said mandating the vaccine for service members is essential. Stephanie Ramos has the latest from the Pentagon. Hi, Stephanie. Diane, the Secretary of Defense has announced he'll seek the president's approval to make the COVID vaccine mandatory for service members no later than mid-September, but that if the vaccine receives full FDA approval or if COVID cases spike within the military, that timeline will be accelerated. Pentagon leaders say making the COVID vaccine mandatory for the 1.4 million active duty troops is an essential move in maintaining military readiness. The president has signaled full support of the plan, writing in a statement, we are still on a wartime footing and every American who is eligible should take immediate steps to get vaccinated right away. And that he's proud of the nation's military men and women for leading the charge. So far, the Pentagon says 60% of active duty troops have been fully vaccinated. Now, the Pentagon also says they're working out those requirements and restrictions for unvaccinated troops. And right now, there's no set deadline to have service members receive the shot, but we have to keep in mind for the military mandated vaccines are nothing new at any given point. A service member may be required to have 17 vaccinations. Military officials say those troops who are not vaccinated may not be able to deploy to countries that have strict local restrictions. Diane. All right, Stephanie Ramos, thanks for that. Coming up, Global Citizen Live is announcing their concert lineup from Paris to Lagos to New York City next month. When we come back, we'll have a look at who's performing and chat live with one of those performers, Will I Am from the Black Eyed Peas. Stay with us. Welcome back. The vote on the bipartisan infrastructure bill is about to get underway. Let's take a live look at the Senate floor now where Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is speaking. Let's listen. The clerk will read the title of the bill for the third time. Calendar number 100, H.R. 3684, an act to authorize funds for federal aid highways, highway safety programs and transit programs and for other purposes. The question is on the bill as amended. The question is on the bill as amended. Yeas and nays. Is there a sufficient second? There appears to be. Clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin, Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Bennett, Mrs. Blackburn, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Booker, Mr. Bozeman, Mr. Braun. No.
So again, it looks like uh, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer actually wow. finished speaking. The vote is now underway. Let's go to congressional correspondent Rachel Scott. Uh, Rachel, walk us through a little bit about how this process works. What are we going to see unfold in the next half hour or so? Yeah, so this vote is just now getting underway in the Senate. It's been a long way, long time coming for a lot of these senators who have had to kind of barrel through some several late nights here on Capitol Hill, including uh, this past weekend trying to fine tune uh, this bill. Several senators opposed some amendments uh, to this bill. And so it's been sort of a long dragged out process. And now we are finally here where these senators are going on the record on whether or not they support this one trillion dollar bipartisan infrastructure package. Hundred and 10 billion for roads and bridges, 39 billion for public transit, 65 billion dollars to expand broadband internet. We are expecting this vote to be bipartisan. Again, this was re this was negotiated by Republicans and Democrats. All in all, we're expecting about 18 to 20 Republicans uh, to vote with Democrats to move this forward and pass this and then it heads over to the House, Diane. Rachel, are you looking out for any potential surprises today? <laughs> always. We are always <laughs> on, on our seats for surprises. But honestly, I think so much of the focus now turns over to the House. You know, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi really has this delicate task here of trying to also appeal to the progressive Democrats in her party who want to see Democrats go big. They want to see them go bold. And they're looking at this bipartisan infrastructure package and they say it just does not go far enough. They see that a lot was actually left out. A lot of Democratic priorities were left out of this bipartisan deal. And so House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is making this decision to not even bring this to the floor for a vote until the Senate passes a much larger package. So when we talk about this has a long way to go, we're looking at possibly the fall until this potentially passes in the House, and that could be weeks before it actually hits President Biden's desk. But he will no doubt uh, probably be celebrating this today. I, we know that he has been on the phone with senators. He's been working the phones personally, trying to get this deal across the finish line, Diane. And that, does it really count as bipartisanship if they are linking these two bills together, one of which has zero Republican support? And that is exactly the argument that you hear from a lot of Republicans who are accusing House Speaker Nancy Pelosi of essentially holding this bipartisan infrastructure package hostage in the House. They are looking at her and saying, hey, why not just put this on the floor for a vote immediately? But again, it comes back to a numbers game. Pelosi told us in a press conference just last week she doesn't come to the floor to lose. I pressed her on why not just bring this to the floor for a vote. This is a major win for the Democratic Party, a major win for the Republican Party. Why not just push this forward? She says that she wants both of these bills to be passed hand in hand. But this is what Republicans are really angry about. Three point five trillion dollars. They say this is excessive in spending. They are not supporting any of these Democratic priorities. Universal pre-K, uh, free community college, billions of dollars to fight climate change. So Democrats are going to try and pass that all on their own, Diane. So who is... Nancy Pelosi planning to use that leverage against? Is it moderate Democrats that might otherwise vote against the larger package that she hopes will vote for it if they're linked together? How exactly is that working politically? Yeah, I think the fear here for a lot of progressive Democrats is that if they just move in the House already to pass this bipartisan infrastructure package, that they just may forget entirely about a larger package that Democrats try and push through on their own. They want all of this to go forward together. A lot of Democrats see this time, this opportunity that we are in right now, as rare for the Democratic Party. They have control of the White House. They have control of the Senate. They have majority in the House. They say that now is the time to go big and sort of push their big and bold agenda, especially ahead of the midterm elections. And again, we talk about the 50-50 split over in the Senate. You know, it's not that much better over in the House. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi could really only afford to lose four Democratic votes. And we've heard from several Democratic progressives who say that they will not vote for this bipartisan infrastructure package unless they see the Senate commit to passing a much larger package first. But the pressure is going to be on Pelosi, and we're already seeing it. I just got a letter in my inbox from several moderate uh, congressmen in the, over in the House who are putting pressure on her to pass this bipartisan infrastructure package first, to not delay on this, to just get this through, and then they can start working out uh, the much larger package that Democrats hope to pass on their own, Diane. All right. Congressional correspondent Rachel Scott. Thanks, Rachel.
Thanks. And we will be right back with a look at the new announcement from Global Citizen Live. Stay with us. Can you feel the beep within my heart? Can't you see my love shine through the dark? All of my baby. Ooh. I can feel it. Welcome back. That was the Black Eyed Peas and Maluma performing the hit song Feel the Beat at Global Citizen's Every Vote Counts event last October. Now the organization is announcing their Global Citizen live concert lineup. Locations will include Paris, Lagos, and New York City, all set to start September 25th, and those performances will air right here on ABC News Live. And let's bring in singer and longtime Global Citizen supporter Will I Am from the Black Eyed Peas and CEO of Global Citizen Hugh Evans. For more on this. Gentlemen, thank you both for being here. I know it's a big day for you. Hugh, I'll start with you. Global Citizen just announced these performances. You've got Lizzo, JLo, Camila Cabello, The Weeknd, of course, the Black Eyed Peas. And they're all performing in this 24 hour worldwide event on September 25th. How is this all going to work? And what's the ultimate goal of the concert? Well, thank you so much, Diane, for having us on your program this morning. Really, Global Citizen Live. It is a once in a generation moment to unite the world to defend the planet and defeat poverty on September 25th. It's taking place during the UN General Assembly meeting on the eve of the COP26 climate negotiations. And the world's greatest artists are coming together from across Lagos, Nigeria, Paris in front of the Eiffel Tower, Rio de Janeiro, New York City, London, Seoul, Los Angeles, Sydney, and more. And it's really focused on that, that enormously important mission Urgent, urgent issues to tackle climate change and make sure that we stop the hunger crisis for the 41 million people on the brink of starvation on the Horn of Africa. And we're thrilled that the Black Eyed Peas are going to be one of the headliners in Paris alongside incredible artists like Ed Sheeran, Doja Cat and more. But all of this is rallying towards that goal of really defending the planet and defeating poverty. And Will, I am you and the Black Eyed Peas. You'll be taking the stage for Global Citizen again this year. You've already performed for this organization. What drew you to this event, and what can fans expect? So fans can expect to be inspired, to be unified on two issues that impact us all. Um, they can expect to be energized with the songs that they love from the groups that they that they like. And the reason why I wanted to, um, you know, not just me, but the Black Eyed Peas wanted to get down and participate and shed light is we're fans of um, Global Citizen as far as a movement and a, pur a purposeful movement and love the work that Hugh, Hugh is doing. And, and, and we're kindred spirits. Um, in 2011, we did a show in Central Park. Um, and, you know, to be here at this crossroads um, in 2021, 10 years later, on a larger scale, um, uh, with the same issues as far as tackling the same issues as far as uh, you know, helping you know solve poverty and and climate change um, is, is an honor, um, and it's work that's needed. And Hugh, this event is taking place in the middle of an ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. It'll also coincide with this year's UN General Assembly. How are you hoping to use that timing to generate change? Well, we know that before the pandemic, the world was already off track to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. And in fact, the pandemic has pushed 150 million people into extreme poverty and and as I said earlier, 41 million people on the brink of starvation. So we're focusing this effort on securing commitments from governments, from corporations and philanthropists to address climate change, famine and vaccine equity. Firstly, on the issue of climate change, Secretary John Kerry calls this moment the last best hope to achieve a major breakthrough in climate change negotiations. So we're calling on the Fortune 500 companies to have um, commit to net zero plans to reduce their carbon emissions. But we also want to see a billion trees planted or restored by 2022. And so we're focused on these issues. And on the issue of COVID-19, we want to see at least a billion 
vaccine doses donated to the world's poorest nations by the end of September, because right now, as the US and the EU cross 50% of their populations fully vaccinated, Africa on the continent, it's less than 3%. And we can't end this pandemic unless we end it for everyone everywhere, because we know that new variants will inevitably emerge. And we don't know if our, if our vaccines will continue to offer protection in the face of new variants. So we have to end this for everyone. And that's why we're focused on these missions. Yeah, an important mission and sounds like it's going to be a great show. Will, I am. Hugh Evans, thank you so much both for being here today. Thank, thank you, you so much. And you can catch Global Citizen Live, Defend the Planet, Defeat Poverty, September 25th, right here on ABC News Live. Meanwhile, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo is set to speak this morning as impeachment proceedings against the governor are heating up in the state legislature. The Assembly Committee investigating sexual harassment and other allegations against Cuomo says it will hold hearings through the end of the month. So we will bring you Governor Cuomo's remarks when they happen and have more on that when we come back. And welcome back, everyone. You are watching ABC News Live. I'm Kira Phillips. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, we are told now, is set to speak this morning uh, at an, as impeachment proceedings against him continue to heat up in the state legislature. The Assembly Committee investigating those sexual harassments uh, claims and other allegations against the governor. He is saying he will he will hold hearings through the end of the month. Let's get straight to ABC's Ariel Reshef. She is in Albany for more. So Ariel, we've been listening to attorney Rita Glavin, uh, who represents Cuomo personally uh, right now, basically coming forward and just uh, pointing out what she says are purposeful errors and omissions to help build a narrative against the governor. Let's just sort of back up as you and I both have been listening to this for about the past 30 minutes or so. Um, what stands out to you thus far with regard to what Glavin has to say about this agenda she believes uh, these women have? Well, first of all, Kira, I think there's high anticipation to hear from the governor himself. We've heard from his attorneys over the course of the last week, but we have not heard from him since that pre-recorded video message last Tuesday in the wake of those bombshell allegations from the AG's report. But Rita Glavin essentially slamming this investigation by the attorney general, saying that this report was biased um, and that dozens, as a result, have called for the governor's resignation. Governor um, has had no opportunity to respond uh, uh, we've heard again from his lawyers, but we haven't heard directly from him. We expect to do so in just a few minutes. Uh, she has said unequivocally that the governor never groped or fondled any of these 11 women. She, she blamed the media for a frenzy that she believes has contributed to this narrative that she believes that these investigators are intentionally spinning here. She says these investigators have acted as prosecutors, judge, and jury for Governor Cuomo. So clearly uh, an air of defiance here and certainly no contrition on the part of uh, Rita Glavin, Cuomo's attorney. And then we'll wait to hear and see what Governor Cuomo has to say himself in just a couple minutes from now, Kira. Okay, we will continue to follow that, uh, Ariel Reshef, uh, that news coming into us now that Governor Andrew Cuomo uh, expected to speak 1145 Eastern Time. We will take that. Ariel, thank you so much. Meanwhile, a lot of other news going on uh, here, and that is also the bipartisan infrastructure uh, bill that uh, is getting actually underway right now on the Senate floor. Uh, we have been following that. This morning, let's bring in uh, ABC News political director Rick Klein for that. What what do you think? Uh, any surprises so far as you've been following this, Rick? Well, Kira, we already saw a yes vote from uh, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. He has signaled that he's likely to support it, but uh, it actually puts him uh, a rare occurrence in the minority in his own uh, in his own conference. But uh, it appears like this is on a glide path to passage. It appears that uh, we're going to have well north of 60, probably approaching 70 uh, senators total, which would mean uh, in the range of 15 or 20 Republicans, which when you went into the process is a lot more than anyone thought was, was plausible or possible. Uh, the original bipartisan agreement had only five Republicans. Uh, but they started to just work it from there, and they've gotten more and more support despite the very vocal opposition of former President Donald Trump, who says this is a major mistake for the Republican Party. So it would appear that, uh, that uh, President Biden and Democrats who've been pushing infrastructure are on the verge of getting this breakthrough, and they're going to have a decent number of Republicans, including their nemesis Mitch McConnell, to thank for this achievement. 
So w what are the next steps uh, in the House, assuming the vote passes? I think we've been pretty clear that there are still a number of hurdles uh, to jump here. It is quite a dance that has to be performed to get this over the finish line and onto President Biden's desk. The next thing that has to happen would be the House to approve this bill. But Speaker Pelosi uh, has listened to the progressive wing of her, of her caucus and said, we're not even going to bring this up for a vote, she says, until or unless we know that the Senate Democrats are on board for a much larger separate package. Uh, that, that, that is going to start, uh, debate on that is going to start right after this vote. And, and that is going to be three and a half trillion dollars as opposed to a trillion dollars change. So that is going to be highly controversial, and it means keeping all of the Senate Democrats on board. It means navigating the parliamentarian in the coming weeks and months. It means crafting legislation, all in a pretty short time frame, uh, trying to finish this by sometime in September. But the Democrats in the House have made clear they view these, these two initiatives as linked. That's explicitly what Republicans don't want to see happen. They are resigned to the fact that Democrats, if they have the votes, they are going to go ahead and do that. We heard that uh, earlier today from Senator McConnell. Even as he votes for this package, he is denouncing the other package. So it is quite complicated. It is uh, a little bit controversial, uh, and it may have quite a bit of political fallout in the end as well. And Rick, I'm being told now uh, we've got word Kamala Harris uh, headed to the Hill now to preside. So a little bit of nugget there to add to our coverage as we continue to talk about this as we're watching the live uh, pictures there on the floor. So Look, President Biden, he ran on this platform of bipartisanship. Uh, this is his top priority here. So this would be a pretty big deal for him and his administration if indeed this bill passes. Uh, no doubt, Kira. I mean, look, a lot of people thought bipartisanship was dead, that the Senate was broken. Uh, Joe Biden rejected both of those ideas. And uh, despite a lot of voices in his own party who said, uh, ignore the Republicans, do what you can with the Democrats, he committed to this process. He uh, joined arms with, a, with a, a good number of, uh, of moderate House members, as well as this group of senators, to try to move something forward. And that was his theory of governance as, and when he was elected president, that there's a chance to unite, that there's a, there's a middle that exists, that you can get things done for the country on the right kinds of issues. Infrastructure would seem perfectly teed up for that moment. It's also, in terms of the larger package, a, a major opportunity for Democrats to validate their vision of how government should work. It's an extraordinarily large investment in not just the hard infrastructure, roads and bridges and internet, but what's come to be known as uh, uh, soft infrastructure, uh, which is the underpinnings that allow Americans to go to work, care for their children, care for their families uh, and the like. Those two initiatives are linked and they are what, what animates Joe Biden. Uh, when he came into office uh, the, a lot, with these barest of Democratic majorities in the House and the Senate, a lot of people thought there was really nothing he could do other than to try to keep the lights on. These would be big wins. And, and starting with this one, it is uh, it, it will go down as a validation of how Joe Joe Biden believes that Washington can work. All right, so Biden believes Washington can work. Meanwhile, we continue to hear from former President uh, Trump. No surprise, uh, he has called the bill a disgrace, that it would make his party look weak, foolish, dumb. Still some 20 Republican senators, Rick, are expected to vote for it. So put into perspective how significant uh, are Trump's words considering where we are this time, where he stands, how people view him as a player or not within the party. Yeah, Kira, this is one of the most remarkable parts of this story is that President Trump, at least on paper, uh, has been making uh, all sorts of noises about how bad this bill is, even saying that uh, he would threaten uh, primaries against Republicans who ran for it. Maybe it held down the numbers a little bit, but ultimately, if you've got 15 or 20 Senate Republicans ready to defy President Trump, that's a pretty major statement about the limits of his sway. Now, it would be the wrong headline to say that President, former President Trump is, not a, a, is now not a major force in the Republican Party. Not true. Not how it is. But in terms of the legislation, legislative agenda in terms of an opportunity to govern, uh, his simple word is not going to be enough. And this is going to happen uh, despite his very strong opposition on an issue, by the way, that, that became almost synonymous with the futility of the Trump legislative agenda at times. Infrastructure, uh, the, the, the running joke of Washington about every week being infrastructure week. Well, finally, Joe Biden is having a week where he is getting infrastructure done and he's having it done uh, despite the opposition of his predecessor. All right, Rick, I want you to uh, tap dance with me a little bit here as we are watching the Senate infrastructure vote go down here on the floor. As you well know, because uh, you're our political director, uh, we are waiting for Governor uh, Cuomo to speak shortly. Uh, within the past hour, we heard from his attorney, Rita Glavin, um, and she came forward. Uh, but 
pointing out and asserting that there were all types of errors and omissions uh, to help uh, omissions rather to help build this narrative against the governor as these 11 women have come forward uh, with allegations of sexual assault, assault. While we are waiting uh, for him to speak, it's about 1146 right now, he should be stepping to the mic, we are told at any moment, uh, following his attorney who just spoke on his behalf. Um, do you think, because this is what everybody is truly waiting for, that he will come forward and resign? A lot of pressure is on him to do so, but if you listen to his attorney, clearly she's trying to point out that this was a bit of a, of a witch hunt, so it doesn't sound like that she was preparing uh, New Yorkers and everybody else that's been paying attention to this uh, for a resignation. Um, what are you hearing? What are your thoughts as we wait for him to step up to the mic? There are no public or private signals that suggest that resignation is imminent. Uh, everything in, in what Governor Cuomo has said and done the last few days suggests that he wants to fight it out. His biggest play right now may be to try to elongate the process. Uh, the House is almost certainly uh, set to impeach him, but by putting out additional evidence out there, he can slow that process and he can leave things in the more unpredictable state Senate. That's maybe the only path he has, but it's really just a path to survival. It isn't a path to back to respectability or to, uh, to clearing his name. Uh, it is a very ugly path. It's a path that many Democrats, uh, if not most Democrats at this point, have said, please avoid this. Do the best thing for the party. Do the best thing for yourself, for your family, for the women that, uh, that stand uh, in this report accusing him, uh, and step aside, because otherwise it's going to be a very ugly end, and there will be an end. There is no legitimate, discernible path to him for him uh, back to, to remain in office, much less to try to run again or to regain some measure of, uh, of efficacy as governor. That signal has been sent. It may not be, though, that Governor Cuomo himself has heard it. And if you hear from his lawyer earlier today, to start to look allegation by allegation and find holes in, that they perceive in the original report, that's not a man who's ready to, to, set, to step aside. Now, he could surprise everyone, uh, and certainly there would be a lot of Democrats sighing relief if he were to, to, to make that kind of surprise and use this as an opportunity to, to try to get out with some degree of grace ahead of an impeachment proceeding. But that is not the Governor Cuomo that we have known and covered for many years, and it is not the, the Governor Cuomo that we'd expect based on what he and his team have said in the last week or so. All right, you're saying this could actually be drawn out, but bottom line, what yeah. I'm hearing from you is if he doesn't resign, he will be impeached, and it pretty much looks like his political career is over. Is it safe to button it that way? I don't see a scenario, a realistic scenario, where he is still governor, say, uh, at the beginning of, of 2022, much less anything real, as close to realistic that has him running for a fourth term next year. Uh, and, and, and even though he has not ruled that out and he signaled to others that he wants to do that, uh, that does not to be, appear to be in the cards in any way. I think short of uh, some really explosive allegation blowing away the entirety or most of that uh, James report from last week from the New York State Attorney General, I don't see how Andrew Cuomo gets his name, his reputation back. And based on those facts, I don't think a lot of people would think he should be getting that back or that he should deserve that. He is fighting way from behind. The support that he might have enjoyed before in the state assembly has absolutely crumbled. The support that he might have enjoyed from national Democrats, from President Biden and Speaker Pelosi and, and Chuck Schumer and Senator Gillibrand from New York on down, it, 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 ultimately totally evaporated. They want him gone. They want him gone last week. And they'll continue to say so uh, until or unless he is gone. So, no, I don't see any way that Andrew Cuomo uh, remains in office and, or, or retains uh, an effective ability to govern in New York going forward. Especially with the movement taking place, the hashtag Me Too in 2021. Exactly. There just is no tolerance for this type of behavior, uh, not only in politics, but in all parts of business and in our lives right now. Um, all right, Rick, we are still, uh, I'm going to ask you to stay with me if you don't mind. Uh, we're still waiting uh, for Andrew Cuomo. Uh, we are hearing to step up to the mic. Why don't we head back to the floor? I'm told that Kamala Harris is now there in chambers uh, as she is presiding over um, what is expected to be, uh, you know, one trillion dollar bipartisan uh, bill, uh, the Senate, uh, members of the Senate there uh, discussing, going back and forth, the vote happening. Uh, let's listen in, Rick, try and figure out what's happening at the moment right now, and uh, we'll chat a little more. Okay. Rick, I am told there is nothing to listen yeah. to uh, at this moment. There is Although nothing there, to listen to. There, there, so there, there could be a few hot mics that uh, we could pick up on some interesting side conversation, but why don't we stick I'll tell to you, the Karen, facts? This is not, 
Yeah, this is this is this is very typical. Watching senators vote is uh, is akin to watching your lawn grow at times. Uh, they take their sweet time, but I heard a gavel. On this vote, here we go. The yeas are 69. The nays are 30. The bill, as amended, is passed. Madam, <laughs> Madam President, Majority Leader. Order. The Senate will be in order, please. And once again, congratulations to all of those who worked hard, so hard, on this very significant and very important bill. And now we proceed to the second track. So, Madam President, I move to proceed to calendar number 122, Senate Con S. Conres 14, the concurrent resolution on the budget, and I ask for the yeas and nays. Is there a sufficient second? There is. The clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin. Aye. Mr. Barrasso. No. Mr. Bennett. Do you want to go? No. Mrs. Blackburn. Mr. Blumenthal. Aye. Mr. Blunt. Aye. Mr. Booker. Thanks, guys. See you later. Madam Vice President. I got you, thank you. Lou Han Cantwell. <laughs> Mr. Bozeman. Anyway, think about it. I got you. <laughs> That's so old. Somebody on it in a drawer. It's from one of my other, other spots over time. Mr. Brown. Mr. Burr. Ms. Cantwell. Straight to embattled New York Governor Andrew Cuomo delivering remarks right now. First time we've heard from him since the allegations were made of sexual harassment. The Attorney General did a report on complaints made against me by certain women for my conduct. The report said I sexually harassed 11 women. That was the headline people heard and saw and reacted to. The reaction was outrage. It should have been. However, it was also false. My lawyers, as you just heard from Rita Glavin, have reviewed the report over the past several days and have already raised serious issues and flaws that should concern all New Yorkers. Because when there is a bias or a lack of fairness in the justice system, it is a concern for everyone, not just those immediately affected. The most serious allegations made against me had no credible factual basis in the report. And there is a difference between alleged improper conduct and concluding sexual harassment. Now, don't get me wrong. This is not to say that there are not 11 women who I truly offended. There are. And for that, I deeply, deeply apologize. I thought a hug and putting my arm around a staff person while taking a picture was friendly. But she found it to be too forward. I kissed a woman on the cheek at a wedding, and I thought I was being nice, but she felt that it was too aggressive. I have slipped and called people honey, sweetheart, and darling. I meant it to be endearing, but women found it dated and offensive. I said on national TV to a doctor wearing PPE and giving me a COVID nasal swab, you make that gown look good. I was joking. Obviously, otherwise I wouldn't have said it on national TV. But she found it disrespectful. I take full responsibility for my actions. I have been too familiar with people. My sense of humor can be insensitive and off-putting. I do hug and kiss people casually, women and men. 
I have done it all my life. It's who I've been since I can remember. In my mind, I've never I take full responsibility for my actions. I have been too familiar with people. My sense of humor can be insensitive and off-putting. I do hug and kiss people casually, women and men. I have done it all my life. It's who I've been since I can remember. In my mind, I've never crossed the line with anyone. But I didn't realize the extent to which the line has been redrawn. There are generational and cultural shifts that I just didn't fully appreciate. And I should have. No excuses. The report did bring to light a matter that I was not aware of and that I would like to address. A female trooper relayed a concern that she found disturbing, and so do I. Please let me provide some context. The governor's trooper detail had about 65 troopers on it. But of the 65, only six women and nine black troopers. I'm very proud of the diversity of my administration. It's more diverse than any administration in history. And I'm very proud of the fact that I have more women in senior positions than any governor before me. The lack of diversity on the state police detail was an ongoing disappointment for me. In many ways, the governor's detail is the face of state government that people see. When I attend an event, people see the detail that's with me. I was continuously trying to recruit more to diversify. On one occasion, I met two female troopers who were on duty at an event. Both seemed competent and impressive. And I asked the state police to see if they were interested in joining. I often meet people, men and women, and if they show promise, I refer them to be interviewed. The state police handled the interviewing and the hiring. And one of the two troopers eventually joined the detail. I got to know her over time, and she's a great professional. And I would sometimes banter with her when we were in the car. We spent a lot of time driving around the state. This female trooper was getting married. And I made some jokes about the negative consequences of married life. I meant it to be humorous. She was offended, and she was right. The trooper also said that in an elevator, I touched her back. And when I was walking past her in a doorway, I touched her stomach. Now, I don't recall doing it. But if she said I did it, I believe her. At public events, Troopers will often hold doors open or guard the doorways. When I walk past them, I often will give them a grip of the arm, a pat on the face, a touch on the stomach, a slap on the back. It's my way of saying, I see you, I appreciate you, and I thank you. I'm not comfortable just walking past and ignoring them. Of course, usually they are male troopers. In this case, I don't remember doing it at all. I didn't do it consciously with the female trooper. I did not mean any sexual connotation. I did not mean any intimacy by it. I just wasn't thinking. It was totally thoughtless in the literal sense of the word but it was also insensitive. It was embarrassing to her, and it was disrespectful. It was a mistake, plain and simple. 
I have no other words to explain it. I want to personally apologize to her and her family. I have the greatest respect for her and for the New York State Police. Now, obviously in a highly political matter like this, there are many agendas and there are many motivations at play. If anyone thought otherwise, they would be naive, and New Yorkers are not naive. But I want to thank the women who came forward with sincere complaints. It's not easy to step forward, but you did an important service. And you taught me, and you taught others an important lesson. Personal boundaries must be expanded and must be protected. I accept full responsibility. Part of being New York tough is being New York smart. New York smart tells us that this situation and moment are not about the facts. It's not about the truth. It's not about thoughtful analysis. It's not about how do we make the system better. This is about politics. And our political system today is too often driven by the extremes. Rashness has replaced reasonableness. Loudness has replaced soundness. Twitter has become the public square for policy debate. There is an intelligent discussion to be had on gender-based actions, on generational and cultural behavioral differences, on setting higher standards, and finding reasonable resolutions. But the political environment is too hot, and it is too reactionary for that now. And it is unfortunate. Now, you know me. I'm a New Yorker, born and bred. I am a fighter. And my instinct is to fight through this controversy, because I truly believe it is politically motivated. I believe it is unfair and it is untruthful. And I believe it, it demonizes behavior that is unsustainable for society. If I could communicate the facts through the frenzy, New Yorkers would understand. I believe that. But when I took my oath as governor, then it changed. I became a fighter, but I became a fighter for you. And it is your best interest that I must serve. This situation by its current trajectory, will generate months of political and legal controversy. That is what is going to happen. That is how the political wind is blowing. It will consume government. It will cost taxpayers millions of dollars. It will brutalize people. The State Assembly yesterday outlined weeks of process that will then lead to months of litigation. Time and money that government should spend managing COVID, guarding against the Delta variant, reopening upstate, fighting gun violence, and saving New York City. All that time would be wasted. This is one of the most challenging times for government in a generation. Government really needs to function today. Government needs to perform. It is a matter of life and death, government operations. And wasting energy on distractions is the last thing that state government should be doing. And I cannot be the cause of that. New York tough means New York loving. And I love New York. And I love you. And everything I have ever done 
has been motivated by that love. And I would never want to be unhelpful in any way. And I think that given the circumstances, the best way I can help now is if I step aside and let government get back to governing. And therefore, that's what I'll do. Because I work for you. And doing the right thing is doing the right thing for you. Because as we say, it's not about me. It's about we. Kathy Hochul, my lieutenant governor, is smart and competent. This transition must be seamless. We have a lot going on. I'm very worried about the Delta variant, and so should you be. But she can come up to speed quickly, and my resignation will be effective in 14 days. To my team, Melissa DeRosa, Robert Mejica, Beth Garvey, Stephanie Benton, Dana Caratanudo, Kelly Cummings, Rich Azapardi, Howard Zucker, Rick Cotton, Jano Lieber, Jack Davies, and the hundreds of dedicated administration officials. I want to say this. Thank you. Thank you. And be proud. We made New York State the progressive capital of the nation. No other state government accomplished more to help people. And that is what it's all about. Just think about what we did. We passed marriage equality, creating a new civil right, legalized love for the LGBTQ community, and we generated a force for change that swept the nation. We passed the SAFE Act years ago, the smartest gun safety law in the United States of America, and it banned the madness of assault weapons. We've saved countless lives with that law. $15 minimum wage, the highest minimum wage in the nation, lifting millions of families' standard of living, putting more food on the table and clothes on their backs. And we led the nation in economic justice with that reform. We have managed every emergency Mother Nature could throw at us. Fires, floods, hurricanes, superstorms, and pandemics. We balanced the state budget, and we got it done on time, more than any other administration, because government should work and perform. Free college tuition for struggling families. Nobody in this state, nobody in this state will be denied their college dream because of their income. We have built new airports, rail, transit, roads all across this state, faster and better than ever before. And more than any state in the nation, the most effective green economy program in the nation. We did more for black and Latino families than any other administration. We did more for working families. We did more for our union brothers and system, sisters. We did more to battle racism and anti-Semitism. Today, so much of the politics is just noise. Just static. Listening there to New York Governor and Andrew Cuomo with a big announcement that. that he is resigning after a state attorney general report released accused him of sexually harassing 11 women. Cuomo denies the allegations but says right now the best thing he can do for New York is step aside and let government continue to govern. Let's go to senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky for more on this. Aaron, what do we know about what went into this decision and what the governor's movements have been since that report came out? Because this is the first time we're hearing from him live. It's just a week after the New York Attorney General report, Diane said that he had sexually harassed 11 women. He prepared a videotaped response that very day, but we hadn't seen him for the last week as he remained holed up in the executive mansion. But earlier this morning, the governor flew from Albany here to New York City so that he could make this announcement. He had come under intense pressure in recent days. Even steadfast Cuomo loyalists had urged him to resign, saying that his impeachment was going to be inevitable. And we heard the Assembly Judiciary Committee outline a whole process that could lead to the governor's impeachment as soon as next month. 
Governor Cuomo said his instinct is to fight because he said he believes the accusations against him are politically motivated. And he says he has not been given a fair chance to respond. And we heard his attorney say that they can't possibly prepare a response by the Friday deadline that the assembly gave him. And so he says now, rather than become a distraction and have government become a distraction, because, as Cuomo put it, he loves the people of this state. He said the best thing he can do now is step aside, and that resignation will take effect in 14 days. And Ariel Reshef is following this for us in Albany as well. Uh, Ariel, the governor wasn't just facing these sexual uh, uh, harassment allegations, but also other allegations related to the pandemic, the management of nursing homes, the management of data in nursing homes, resources used for his book. And all of this was being investigated there in Albany. How does this progress now? Is that investigation now over? Well, essentially, the investigation by the assembly would be null and void. That's what the Judiciary Committee chairman said yesterday. If the governor were to resign, then it would render their proceedings essentially, uh, as I said, null and void. But we have to remember that this is a governor that's also facing a possible criminal charge here in Albany stemming from his executive assistant's complaint against him that he allegedly groped her, something he firmly denied. I just was struck in his comments that there was this air of defiance mixed with a bit of contrition. You heard him adamantly deny any of those allegations of sexual misconduct, of harassment, but in the same breath apologized to his accusers, saying that he understands he had hurt them and had offended them. Um, we also know that he, he touched on the fact that this is a polarized political environment and that he couldn't have possibly gotten a fair process here, something that has been echoed over the course of the last week by his attorneys. So this is certainly a bit of a whiplash moment, a bit of a bombshell announcement from Governor Cuomo that he will step aside. And as Aaron mentioned, that will be effective in 14 days from now. Diane. And Aaron, we also heard from Cuomo's attorney before he got up and spoke. And she was taking aim at the report, saying the report was biased, that they omitted evidence that could have made him look better in that report, that the investigators themselves were biased, and that the victims who came forward, or alleged victims who came forward, may have misinterpreted things. What happens now? Because what we heard from, from his attorney sounds like they are gearing up for a legal battle here. Defense attorney Rita Glavin was the preamble to Governor Cuomo's resignation, and, and it was almost as if he wanted her to, to set up that he was somehow forced out because of the circumstances, because the report is political, because the process was unfair, because the women misinterpreted what he considered to be normal behavior. But the governor also did acknowledge that, that he made women feel uncomfortable, and he addressed for the first time the allegation involving a state trooper on his personal security detail, and though he denied or said he didn't remember touching her back or her stomach as alleged, he apologized to her and her family, uh, saying that, that women should be believed, and he said it was a mistake, plain and simple. But it's still possible that the Assembly Judiciary Committee moves forward with its impeachment investigation. And although the consequence, the Judiciary Chairman Charles Levine said, would be moot in terms of removal from office, there is still a mechanism the Assembly could undertake so that Andrew Cuomo can no longer hold elective office in this state. And Aaron, in terms of what happens now in New York, with the governor stepping aside, he said the lieutenant governor will take over. How do things move forward from there? Kathy Hochul is the lieutenant governor. She is from Western New York. She lives in Buffalo. She's been a, a, a longtime political hand. Her husband was the U.S. attorney uh, in the, the Western District of New York in Buffalo and Rochester. So she is a known quantity in certain parts of the state. But the rest of the state is going to be able to, to, to get to know her now as she takes on uh, the, the governor's duties. And for, for Kathy Hochul, we know she has spent the last several weeks consulting with aides and allies to see how how she is going to be able to, to step in and manage the state. Remember, we all came to know Governor Cuomo through his pandemic briefings and his, what he said was straight talk about the facts. It was his personal delivery of, of all of the messages that consume New York politics right now. And so the lieutenant governor is going to have to figure out how to step in to, to those very large shoes in terms of public profile or decide whether she wants others to take on a more a more prominent role. Our senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky and ABC's Ariel Reshef in Albany.
Thank you both. Again, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo has just resigned from office, effective in 14 days after a state attorney general report accused him of sexually harassing 11 women. The governor says he did not uh, sexually harass those women. He's denying the allegations, but saying for the sake of the state, because he loves New York, he is stepping aside. And again, we have, we'll have more on this on ABC News Live's continuing coverage. And again tonight on World News Tonight with David Muir. Now we'll return to your original programming. And you are watching ABC News Live. I'm Kira Phillips. We are continuing our coverage now of the embattled New York governor, Andrew Cuomo, announcing he will step down. Following his resignation, it will be effective 14 days from today. Here he is just moments ago with that announcement. And I think that given the circumstances, the best way I can help now is if I step aside and let government get back to governing. And therefore, that's what I'll do. Because I work for you. And doing the right thing is doing the right thing for you. Because as we say, it's not about me. It's about we. Kathy Hochul, my lieutenant governor, is smart and competent. This transition must be seamless. We have a lot going on. I'm very worried about the Delta variant, and so should you be. But she can come up to speed quickly, and my resignation will be effective in 14 days. Let's continue our following coverage now. Let's get straight to Ariel Reshef. She's in Albany. She's been following this from the very beginning. Ariel, it was just a week ago that the AG came out uh, with her investigative report with these 11 women making these allegations of sexual harassment in just one week. Uh, someone like Andrew Cuomo, who has always been a fighter, he even pointed that out as he resigned, uh, very much surprising uh, a lot of people that this happened so quickly. Yeah, my how far we've come in just one week. I was describing this as a sort of whiplash as as I've been covering this. This was essentially a bombshell announcement by the governor set up, as Aaron pointed out in our previous coverage, as a preamble from his attorney laying out the reasons why that investigation, the state investigation and this report were inherently biased, were politicized. And he essentially said, because of the greater good of New Yorkers and for the greater good of New Yorkers, I'm going to step aside now and allow government to govern as opposed to going through those rigorous channels of the impeachment proceedings. So right now, uh, I, I would assume that those legislators in the uh, state house behind me are trying to figure out what their next move will be. But an air of contrition in some respects from the governor saying, I understand that I may have offended these 11 women. And for that, I am sorry, but also defiance saying I did not sexually harass or touch anyone inappropriately, Kira. So what does happen next? I know this is all moving so quickly, Ariel, and you've been there in Albany now for days following uh, that case there. Any word to how attorneys will proceed from your vantage point? Well, Rita uh, Glavin, his attorney, says that there was essentially no way they could have met the Judiciary Committee's deadline of Friday to submit additional evidence, that there were key pieces of evidence she hasn't even seen from the report yet. Uh, so we also know from the Judiciary Committee chairman yesterday, he said if the governor were to resign, the impeachment proceedings themselves may be null and void. However, they could still undertake some proceedings in order to ensure that he can never run for office again. So it will be very interesting, and I think a lot of people are waiting to see whether this assembly does in fact take up those impeachment proceedings and drop articles so that this governor can never run for office again. Ariel Reshef will continue to follow the breaking news with you uh, throughout the day and into the evening, I am sure. Ariel, thank you so much. I want to bring in now host of the Law and Crime Network and ABC News legal contributor, contributor rather, Brian Buckmeyer. He's uh, joining us now by phone. Um, Brian, your thoughts of uh, what happens now with regard to the other allegations that are out there, the other women that have come forward, what's the next move? We now see that the governor is is resigning. He's he's going to be gone from office, but there are still 11 women with allegations that appear in the attorney general.
General's uh, investigative report. Where does this go legally from here? Absolutely. Thank you for, for having me on. So I think it actually just started with his resignation. Um, maybe I'm a little bit jaded, but when I hear him talk about New Yorkers and talk about apologizing to the officer who's on a security detail, uh, that, I think, is kind of reaching out to who he believes will be the potential juries or jurors in his case. Now, apologizing to the officer who's on a security deal, detail is a great thing to do. Everyone's looking and expecting to do that. But that allegation is past the statute of limitations. If there are any charges that Andrew Cuomo, former Governor Andrew Cuomo, as of two weeks from now, is going to be facing, that's forcible touching and sexual abuse in the third degree. Those are A and B class misdemeanors, respectively. So it appears that when he's making these apologies, he seems to be very strategic in apologizing to those that he may perceive the statute of limitation is long gone. I think that officer claimed those, that incident happened in 2017, so that's way past the two years. But as you heard from Brittany Comiso, or Executive Assistant One, where those allegations happened much more recently, we're seeing him fighting back a lot more. He's got a case potentially in Albany that he's got to think of, and every other county in the state of New York, especially Manhattan, is looking to see if they can bring charges as well. So he has to really think about not only this case in Albany, but he's probably very, very worried if there's a second forcible uh, assault case coming up, because if the second one gets a conviction, he could have to register as a sex offender. Oh, wow. Okay, that just takes the story down uh, a whole nother avenue. Uh, definitely a valid for discussion. Um, backing up just a minute, though, as you are pointing out the other cases now that he is going to be facing legal ramifications. Is this why, uh, be pri just prior to his resignation, uh, Brian, that his personal attorney came forward uh, laying out what she says were purposeful errors and omissions to help build a narrative against the governor in this AG's investigation. Was she sort of, prior to the resignation, sort of prepping what she is saying is an investigative report on behalf of the AG that's full of mistakes and omissions and loopholes? Was she sort of setting the groundwork there for how he is going to proceed now after this resignation in dealing with possibly a number of legal cases before him? I would say wholeheartedly yes. I say that um, as much as Andrew Cuomo is saying that he does not want to fight this in the court of public opinion, that fight is already there. And so what his lawyers are doing, which is the appropriate thing to do when you're representing your client, is to fight where the fights occur. And so the lawyer coming out and saying, these are the errors, these are the things that the investigation is omitting. And here is my client talking about all the work that we are doing. He's talking about we. Uh, and again, kind of laying the groundwork for what I think we're going to be probably seeing down the line as at least the case in Albany progresses and potentially other cases uh, around the state of New York may continue. We're going to continue to hear the narrative of, I did this for you. I stepped down and I resigned for you because we are fighting COVID. I don't want you to get dragged into my mess as well. This is a political battle, and I'm going to fight it on my own. And I, I think that he – this is – as a defense attorney, I am giddy uh, just from a, from a technical standpoint of how well he is walking this narrative and how well his lawyers are as well, uh, just from like a technical standpoint. And, and I think that's what we're seeing. We're seeing – I'll admit to those charges which are past the statute of limitations – especially to a community such as law enforcement, where I know I can get someone who's going to agree with me, but I'm going to fight very adamantly and claim it's political for those charges that are more serious and that could definitely affect me. As a defense attorney, if you were uh, representing Andrew Cuomo right now, uh, how, how do you see this? I mean, is there any light at the end of the tunnel for what he is up against now? <laughs> So you're, you're asking me that one question that my wife always hates when when we see people who are we believe to have committed a crime. And I look at her and I say, there is an argument where he could win. And then my wife walks away very mad because it kind of makes sense. Um, what Andrew Cuomo is being charged with is called forcible touching. And the way the statute reads is that you touch a person for no legitimate reason, but to degrade, abuse or for sexual gratification. 
And so what Andrew Cuomo, when he's saying, this is my culture, this is what I do, as facetious as it sounds, and he's saying, I touch men and I touch women, gay, straight, black, white, tall, short. He's basically saying there is a legitimate reason why, for why I do this to people, and it is not for my sexual gratification. It sounds very much like how I would maybe argue for one of my clients as a public defender, trying to avoid the language of the statute to say, yes, it is a crime to touch a woman in this way. And yes, my client is very, very aware of the issues that affect women when it comes to sexual assault. However, this doesn't fit the crime in which he's accused of. He's not that type of guy. So the jaded part of me is kind of hearing that in terms of what charges he could face. And I'm seeing a narrative that could work in front of a jury to say, hey, my client stepped down as the governor. He's doing this for you. He didn't want this political mess to affect your life. But let's call this political witch hunt what it is. And he didn't do that for the reasons the statute is claiming he did. That is what I see and what I hear when I listen to Andrew Cuomo. Brian, thank you. ABC senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky also has been following this since the very beginning, is covering now what we know is Governor Andrew Cuomo's resignation uh, just 14 days away now. A couple of questions for you, Aaron, looking forward. The assembly still going forward with its investigation, correct? And the purpose of that we to keep him completely out of politics. We haven't heard that the assembly is going to in any way abandon their investigation at this point, Kira, and they were scheduled to hear the evidence over the next couple of weeks and, and hold public hearings about impeachment and sexual harassment violations uh, through the end of August. And although at this point the, the remedy of removal from office would be moot, the Assembly Judiciary Committee Chairman Charles Levine said it's still possible they move forward in order to prohibit Andrew Cuomo for, from ever holding elective office in the state. At this point, we don't know whether that would even be tenable for, for Cuomo as a practical matter, but it is possible, and we're waiting to, to find out the Assembly's next move, that they continue ahead because they've said they've been to, trying to get the facts about women and about nursing home data and about preferential COVID testing for Governor Cuomo's family and friends, about the use of state resources to write a book, any number of controversies that have dogged the governor uh, over the last several weeks and months. Aaron Katursi, thank you so much. Shauna Lloyd uh, with us now as well, ABC News contributor and managing partner at the Cochrane firm, uh, Shauna Lloyd. So, Sean, let me just ask you, as an attorney, as a woman, uh, living in this time of hashtag me too and looking at the fact that this AG investigation came out only one week ago and now one of the most powerful politicians who's been around for decades carries the Cuomo name is resigning. How powerful of a message uh, is that? I think it's a very significant message. What we're seeing is that the cultural norms and what's expected behavior in the workplace is changing. And people are much more vocal about ensuring that that's carried through from the top of government all the way down and across many industries. So the Me Too movement has brought light to behaviors that have changed, are no longer accepted, and will no longer be tolerated and are illegal in the workplace. So you're seeing that happening, and that's happening across all sectors. Uh, final question, Shauna, before we let you go. Just looking forward, this is not just about a resignation, but this is also about 11 women who came forward and spoke openly and honestly uh, to the attorney general. What is next? Looking forward, moving on beyond the career of Governor Andrew Cuomo, but these women and their and what they have done with regard to coming forward what happens to them well they continue on the resignation will have no effect on any civil liability or criminal liability that can be established so if these women who have come forward have claims that they can still make against Governor Cuomo, then they will continue. The resignation will not stop either criminal charges or civil litigation in any form or fashion. ABC News contributor Shauna Lloyd, thank you so much.
We're also following the uh, other breaking news out of Washington uh, here in our nation's capital, where the Senate just passed the $1.1 trillion infrastructure bill with support from members on both sides of the aisle. The bill passed by a vote of 69 to 30, 19 Republicans, including Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, joining Senate Democrats to advance that bill out of the Senate chamber. Kamala Harris presiding. President Biden expected to speak earlier th or early this afternoon. We will bring that to you live as soon as it happens. Meanwhile, ABC News Live will continue to follow the latest developments and we'll have a full wrap up 3 p.m. Eastern right here on The Breakdown. Until then, I'm Kira Phillips and we'll see you at 3. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.